and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's sing that again. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen, amen. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I am so glad that you're here today. If you're here today and your cell phone is on, you're on a computer to follow me. I don't see anybody moving. You're here today and you're a visitor. We have visitor cards just like that. Put them in the offering plate. Fill it out. You can also put your prayer request on that as well. We need a nursery worker to fill in on Wednesday nights. So raise your hand. Everyone that doesn't raise their hand is just going to be put out. All right. So be praying about that. Think about that. Um, someone tell me the time on that. Thirty to six thirty, something like that. So if you can do that, please do that. Senior Adult Rally, October the fifth, Lakeview. Leave the church at seven thirty a.m. Let Steve know if you're going to sign up. There's a sign up sheet right outside of his office. Time's out on that. Still got it. Okay. Uh, Day of Revival coming up Sunday, October fifteenth. Mary Jordan. Sunday to come. Pray for our cottage prayer meeting, Friday, October the 6th, 5 p.m. at Monica and Marty's. Thursday, October the 12th, 5 p.m. at the Parkview. Listen to my announcement. Keep you posted on that. You can get there early. Pray late. Yes, sir. And our fall festival is coming up, y'all. It seemed like this last Sunday was January, but this year is moving on. Fall festival Saturday, October the 28th, and that'll be dinner, y'all. Good point. Um, so out in the foyer, we have a Fall Fest sign-up. So if you'd like to work that um, in any capacity, just sign up here just so I can have a number. So I can plan based on however many people we have signed up for that. But I Exactly. I think this could be a really big event for our church and just a way to show the community around us that we love them, that we're here for them, and we can show them the love of Jesus through that. So we'll have the sign-up sheet out there, and then also I, I'm going to put a box out there. We, um, I asked if we can start collecting bags of candy to use as prizes. Um, I think it's just super easy. Every time you go grocery shopping, maybe just throw a bag in there. That's the easiest way to do that. But with doing games, we need to have some prizes, and candy is probably just the cheapest and easiest one for us to do. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Anybody? Great attendance on the sea at the pole. Thank you to everyone that helped with that and that saw you at the pole. Some of us overslept, not all of us, but thanks to everyone that was there. It was a great turnout. Nothing else, anybody? I'll go ahead and pray then. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord, so thankful to be in your house. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I ask right now for anointment for the praise team, Lord, anointment for Brother Dan. 
It's my prayer right now that if someone doesn't know you, will come to know you from the song of the words, Lord. I just pray right now that you'll continue to use this church, that you'll guide this church, Lord, that you'll use us, that we'll be a lighthouse for you, that when people look at us, they'll see you. And Lord, I just pray right now that you prepare us to give us something to say, Lord, about you when people ask. Make them ask, Lord. I just love you so much. I ask that you continue to guide this church. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. Let's all stand as we sing, send the light. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Jesus charged us to go out and spread the word. There's a call comes ringing over the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There's a call for soul. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for the crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. All right, you may be seated as we have a video this morning. Hola, soy Obero Ochoa. Soy casado hace 22 años. Tengo una hija de 19 años y soy plantador de iglesias con SBTC hace 12 años. Bueno, mi proceso para encontrarme como sembrador de iglesia fue bastante sufrido, por decirlo de esta manera, porque yo era pastor de una iglesia en Bogotá, Colombia, y era una iglesia tradicional y tenía, por supuesto, todas las tradiciones y todos los problemas de una iglesia antigua. Debo decirles una, algo, yo llegué con cabello a esa iglesia y ahí perdí todo estos huecos que ustedes me ven, ahí los perdí. Pero la frustración era tan grande que decidimos eh, buscar a Dios porque nosotros queríamos ser sembradores. Así que decidimos buscar a Dios y entendimos que Dios quería movernos a los Estados Unidos para fundar iglesias. Fue así como contactamos a alguien en la embajada la americana y le contamos que queríamos fundar iglesias aquí para no alargarles la historia. Un año después, yo estoy llegando a la embajada en los Estados Unidos, en Bogotá, Colombia, y el oficial me está diciendo, bienvenido a mi país, ustedes son residentes americanos. Llegamos a los Estados Unidos y en el 2012 fundamos esta congregación, Vida Victoriosa Prosper. Después de siete años entendimos que era tiempo de fundar una nueva iglesia. Fue así como decidimos fundar la iglesia, hablamos con el BTC y, y ellos por supuesto que estaban dispuestos a apoyarnos y decidimos ir al pueblo de Tioga en Texas y empezamos con todo el ánimo, con, con todo el equipo, pero siete meses después, COVID y COVID nos dejó de manos cruzadas y preguntándonos qué hacemos, qué hacemos para evangelizar en medio de una pandemia. Descubrimos un pequeño restaurante donde la gente del, puesto, del pueblo 
fluía con, con mucha intensidad, descubrimos que había una mesera que hablaba español y cultivamos una relación con ella por dos años. Esta mesera, que se llama Juanita, fue clave en el proceso porque ella conocía la comunidad y nos abrió las puertas de otra manera para poder evangelizar y contactar personas cerca del templo. Los fondos de Alcanzando Texas han impactado directamente en nuestro ministerio. Sin ellos sería mucho más difícil la plantación de iglesias. Ellos han caminado con nosotros paso a paso en cada etapa del proceso de siembra de una nueva iglesia. Eh, nosotros estamos supremamente agradecidos por la manera como ellos nos han soportado, nos han abrazado en este proceso de siembra. Y con ustedes, las iglesias que aportan, que soportan este ministerio, sin ustedes, sin las iglesias que soportan este ministerio, nada de esto estaría sucediendo. Yo le animo a que usted siga apoyando, soportando este ministerio porque creemos que Dios se está moviendo a través de ello. Amén, amén. I couldn't read the words, so <laughs> I understood the Iglesias, Dose, and American. I, I got those three. Yeah, amen. Missionaries. You know that uh, no matter what language, you know, God knows it all. And we're supposed to go and we're supposed to sing about the wondrous story that Jesus Christ has for us. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. I will sing the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he led his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me found the sheep that went astray through his loving arms around me drew me back into his way yes i'll sing the wondrous story of the christ who died for me sing it with the saints in glory gathered the crystal sea he will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet yes I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ to die for me sing it when the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea amen as we sing that wonderful story we've heard a joyful noise about Jesus saves amen We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the way, but tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, 
Jesus saves, wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean waves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Jesus saves. The Bible tells us he came for the whole world. If you got anything in the world, I'd rather have Jesus than anything else in this whole world. It's no George Beverly Shea song that uh, changed his life. Let's sing it as we praise him this morning. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. Dread. 
chorus again. Then to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than This world affords today. Let us pray. Father God, we do come today just thanking you that you have blessed us in so many ways, Father, that I know everyone here or to feel the same way as that song, we'd just rather have you as anything, Father, for with you, you have everything. We have everything with you, Father, and we just praise you for what you give us and bless us each and every day. I do ask you to be with Brother Danny this morning as he brings your word. Just speak through him, Father, and just let our hearts and our ears be ready to accept whatever it is you want us to take home with us today, Father. And if there's any here that doesn't know you, I just pray that their hearts will be touched today and that before they leave this building today that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I do ask you to be with Kathy this morning as she brings a special word for song. And what a blessing, beautiful voice she has that you blessed her with, Lord. So we just ask you now to be with this offering this morning, Father, and use it to glorify your kingdom. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Was loud. Um, what a blessing, y'all! If to stand up here and have a little second grade uh, child singing next to me, and, and I hear her singing, and it's just a sweet sound. I can only imagine how blessed God is. If He's blessing me that much, I can't even imagine how blessed God is. Um, this song, Brother Danny, in his message last week, this song came to my mind, and so I had to hunt it down so that I'd sing it today. Um, purify my heart. Man, don't I need my heart to be purified all the time. I am. I fall short every day, but I always pray. I always try to remember to pray, and I always pray that God blesses this song, that somebody's blessed by it, and that he comes out through the end of it. <laughs> within me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 5110.
Shouldn't that be the desire of our hearts? Uh, to be holy, to be dedicated, to be sold out to our God. Uh, you know, as we prayed last night, is, and I would encourage those that can, and we've got two more cottage prayer meetings before we... We have our uh, day of renewal, our revival day, our morning and evening time when Larry's going to be here to, to preach, Larry Jordan. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to be part of that. Uh, we prayed for, to scare somebody off here, we probably prayed for 45 minutes, but it didn't seem like any time because we were all we're doing conversational prayer and, and people praying from their heart. Uh, you know, we just sometimes I feel in my own life and, and in the life of our church, we just don't take any of it real seriously. And it's good to have a good time and it's good to be able to enjoy ourselves in the Lord, but you know it's about it's about him. It's about reaching people for him. Uh, people dying, going to hell everywhere. Uh, since we've been praying and doing specific prayers and uh, accumulating names, there's at least two of those people on that list that have have died and without Christ. And uh, and we do need to enjoy our life in Christ, and then we also need to take things seriously as well. And so we have been preaching through 2 Timothy. Uh, and that kind of has been the, the theme, taking discipleship seriously. Uh, Paul's dying. I mean, he's going to die soon. He's going to have, have his head chopped off. And he's appealing. And he's ministering still to his friend and child and compatriot and co-worker, Timothy. And he, his message throughout this letter that he writes to Timothy is, hey, I'm, I'm going to die, and it's okay, but we need to entrust what I had that I gave to you for you to give to others. We need to take discipleship seriously. And so this morning, that's where we're going to be in, in 2 Th Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 to 7. You know, discipleship, we need to take seriously, and it's simple, but it's hard. The Christian life is simple but it's hard. The truth of the Christian life is simple, and yet it's costly. And so that's what we want to talk about. Father, we, in 
invite you now to speak to our hearts this morning. Cause us this morning, Lord, to get serious. And Lord, we, we have opportunity now with, with, with just a kind of an artificial day of re- renewal and emphasis for renewal and revival and, and evangelism coming up here uh, in a couple of weeks. So Lord, may we use this opportunity as a time to get serious, that we might pray for others like we might not normally pray, that we might pray as if you'll hear and answer and people might be saved and lives might be turned around. Lord, there's devastation, there's heartbreak, there's uh, all of the issues related to sin uh, in individuals' lives, there's all the issues related to this broken world going on. And and Lord, I pray that you might intervene, that Lord, you would cause us to be renewed. You you said if if we'll seek you humbly, turn from our carelessness and and complacency and uh, and sin and and turn to you, you'll, you'll hear and you'll answer and you'll do marvelous things. And so, Father, that's what we desire. And Lord, would you start even today as we, as we think about discipleship this morning, as we think about the simplicity, but the difficulty that we have in, in, in caring about people around us enough to, to reach them and to help them to grow in Christ. Father, break our hearts for people. Engage us in a way that will uh, reorient our lives that uh, we might use every moment of every day that we have left in this life focused on you. Father, work in our lives this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul is writing to Timothy, and his message in this letter is about discipleship, a growing in Christ, growing in Christ today together. And as he, he makes it really pretty simple because if we want other people to come to Christ and grow in Christ, here's the simplicity. First of all, discipling is about relationships. It's about people. Can I say that it has to be about people and it has to be about people first. You have no interest in what I have to say unless you think I care about you. Now, the Word of God is powerful. We'll talk about the Word of God, and and it'll do things. But can I say, you want to know that I care about you. People that you interact with want to know that you care about them. It's about intimate human relationships. Uh, the epitome of a discipleship uh, uh, relationship, Paul and Timothy. He says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's about intimate human relationships. It's about caring for people. Uh, Paul could easily have said, I'm the apostle, you're the disciple, I'm the older guy, you're the younger guy, you do what I tell you to do. He could have done that, but that's not how he's appealing. He's appealing as a father and a child relationship. And and obviously, Timothy's not his biological child, but you could argue very much, and Paul states in multiple places, you are my spiritual child that in those early days when he was with his mother and grandmother, when when Paul is doing mission activity in their area, he comes and begins to follow and becomes part of the mission team, and and Paul invests in him. It's about intimate human relationships. Uh, And we can make several mistakes as we desire for people to come to Christ and to know Christ. But, but can I, I you, you just can't overemphasize how important it is 
to have intimate relationships, close close relationship with people. Uh, you know, if I think about the people that have impacted my life, and we've done that occasionally, ask you about who's impacted you. And, and almost always it comes down to people that, that invested, people that cared, people that you could go, that you don't have to be on top of the hill all the time, that can hear you when you go, you know, I just hate doing this. I despise those people that I'm ministering with. Now, usually it doesn't get that bad, but, you know, on any given day, you might have those moments, right, right, Steve, where it's like, those people. You know, that's the big joke we have around here all the time is, you know, ministry is great, except for those stinking people. You know, if it wasn't for those stinking people, ministry would be great. No, the reality is. That's exactly what ministry is. That's exactly what discipleship is. You know, it wouldn't it be great if you could, you know, all right, I want somebody in this room, I want a disciple, and you'll just be obedient and listen and, and attentive and all of these things all the time, and we'll go, you know, we'll do life together, and you'll grow in Christ, and it'll all be a wonderful thing. And those, to some extent, Paul and Timothy was, was some of that. That's not usually the way it works. Usually, people are just frustrating. They, they, they won't commit. They are inconsistent. You know, they, they do all kinds of things. And sometimes even, just not just disappoint you, but may even talk behind your back. Now, I don't, hopefully we don't have a whole lot left of that going on around here. But that's kind of a human thing, right? But it's caring for people. Knowing they're broken, and yet you just love them. And you see what God wants to do with them. Not where they're at, but what God wants to do. And, and, and Paul has invested his life in Timothy. And, and what a marvelous, what a marvelous outcome it has been. As Timothy has been the, guy, the go-to guy, that, that when Paul, he's not able to do something, what is it? He gives it to Timothy, who has his heart, who's like Paul, who he has reproduced into his life an intimate human relationship. And, you know, if we're going to invest in people, we've got to pour into them. Uh, can I also say that, and, and this is, of course, we don't have many parents, uh, we, we don't have many kids still at home, but this really is applicable there. Uh, but it's also applicable in our relationships is you got to let people go too. You know, when we're working with people, the goal is not for them to be under my thumb. The, the goal of a parent is not to have children that live in your house and do what you tell them the rest of your life. It's not the goal. The goal is to launch them and to move them beyond here and to be able to make good decisions, sometimes not even the decisions that we would make, but good decisions before God. It's about launching people, respecting people, and even in discipling, and even in our relationships. You know, I probably, I mean, the reality is I probably know more Bible than most anybody here, probably, but that doesn't mean anything because everybody I'm around can feed into my life as well. I don't have the right answers. I don't know all the right stuff. And together, though, we can, we can grow together, and that's what a relationship is about. It's about connecting with people, growing together, intimate human relationships. Uh, it's about supernaturally empowered through a Christ relationship. Boy, that I got lost. I can't, don't even know what those words mean. It's about, can I say supernaturally empowered? The, the neat thing. We are not like people somewhere else. We are strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul says, be strengthened, Timothy, in the grace that is in Christ. 
Christ Jesus, and that is so full. The reality is, I don't have anything to say that can change your life. I mean, yeah, yes, the Word of God can. But, but, you know, I can't make that happen. But He can make that happen. We, you know, we're not weird. Maybe we are weird. Uh, we're not this weird group that's always looking for some mystical answer, and we'll come back to in a minute. Talk about the Word of God as the foundation. But, but I am not limited to my own ability. Uh, we were talking a while back. Uh, I don't know whether I've ever said that or not. When I was in college, uh, and I just had got, just gotten saved, and I was taking a speech course, and everybody would go, I knew this. I did mediocre. I, I am not a great speaker. I know that. You know, I'm a mediocre guy. Any power, any impact comes from Christ himself. He is the empowerment. You know, if God has called me to do this, he also then empowers to change lives. Now, in seminary, I did a lot better. Whether that's some of that's growth, some of that's human. But the truth is, Christ is the empowerment. And he's called us to invest in people's lives. And he will empower us to do that. And oh, by the way, he also empowers to bring about change in people's lives. Because the truth is, you know, we're all in some process of being changed. And if we're investing in people, they're in a different place than we are, probably. And we need to allow the Spirit of God to work in their lives. In fact, notice it. He says, be strengthened, but be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And of course, that, you know, the whole empowerment, strengthened, that he uses many times implies the Holy Spirit's empowerment. But, but notice here, he specifically says, by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the grace that, that saved me, that covers my current sin, the grace that he wants to be the strength of my relationship with you. Because the truth is, you're still at heart deeply marred by sin. And of course you're going to do things that are disappointing. And of course you're going to do things that drive me crazy. And by the way, I will do things that drive you crazy as well. <laughs> so we've got to have grace towards those people that drive us crazy. <laughs> but, but, you know, and we laugh and joke. But, you know, we, I think it's so profound. Be strength, our strength is in grace. The ability to go, you know, you're broken. And sometimes you do stuff that just is off the wall. And it's okay. Because Christ is still at work. And love covers a multitude of sin. And that's the attitude we ought to have. You know, one of the biggest problems, you know, especially, you know, you have a ministry or you have something and, and God is at work. And God starts doing stuff. What is a huge problem? is people start nitpicking, lacking grace, and setting standards for people or setting expectations on people that are just unfair that we just need to give grace. What if we just gave each other a bunch of grace? You know, what, what if, and I haven't had one, I haven't had my, you know, low blood sugar episode, but it's been, been, been at least a few weeks since I had one of those excuses to be sharp or, or bark. Uh, yeah, I always tell say bark. I, you know, I, I'll sometimes bark, you know. And it's wrong. And it's wrong to do that. And you know, and I know, and, and, and there's different people around here that have seen me bark. <sighs> and I always grieve about that. You know, to lack self, I mean, a pastor has to be under control. 
he does not have the option to not be under control. Just not an option. And I fail sometimes. And it grieves me. And how good is it when people give me grace and not discount me? And in all of our relationships, isn't that way? You know, whether it's in, you know, deacons or whether it's in Sunday school or, or youth ministry or children's ministry, we're a bunch of just raw sinners that have been saved by grace and is in some process of being changed. We need to be strengthened by grace. That says, it's okay that you're having a hard time today. And it's okay that what you did was just, you know, maybe wrong and maybe disappointed me or hurt my feelings or differed from the way I would do it. And we just need to give grace to be strengthened, that the ministry could be strengthened by grace. We need that. It's the only way ministry can grow. You, well, you got two options. One is for everything to look exactly the same. So you run off everybody that's different, and it's all done exactly one way, and everybody's on exactly the same page. And, and, you know, and I suppose that can work, but that's not life, nor is that the church. The church thrives in diversity, and that means I've got one perspective, you've got a different perspective, and together, by grace, strengthened by grace, we move forward in a way that we could never go with one or the other, strengthened supernaturally in Christ, based on grace in Christ, because we're one. We're one in one body. We, we've talked about in Christ is, is that sense in which we have been redeemed and we are now his body, and, and he is in us, he is empowering us, and together we are one and have unity, even when we're different, and by grace, we're strengthened in this deep relationship called discipling. Discipling is about relationships. It's a supernaturally empowered relationship in Christ, based on the cross, that in fact, He's died for us. And He's forgiven us. And brought me into a body and you into a body, and together we are. We are unified in Christ. And now we give each other the same grace that Christ gave us. What a great place that is. What a great place of growing together, this being uh, in, in a discipling relationship. Uh, and, and by the way, can I say it's also an intentional investment. He says to Timothy, entrust to faithful men what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And we'll, un we'll unpack some of that a little bit. But right now I just want to say it's intentional. And the goal is not just that you might grow in Christ, but that you might grow in Christ and, and reach out to others. That it might replicate itself. In fact, what a great thing it would be if in this church a group of people rose up that were more talented and gifted at these things than I am to turn around and do that for other people. And you get a, a multiplication effect. Uh, you, you know, I understand. I, you know, I understand when, uh, and sometimes it'll come up, well, you know, we, we need to direct this person to the pastor and the pastor will lead them to Christ or the pastor will do this or the pastor will do. And, and I respect that. And, and you know, in, in some ways, you know, I should be especially gifted to do those things. But you know, it doesn't have to work that way. What if you led them to Christ? What if you invested in them? What if, uh, you know, if it all single threads through me, then I'm the single point of failure, and boy, are we in trouble plenty. What if, think about ministry level. What if instead of me running everything, Steve has total responsibility for, for music. And, and, of course, you know, we, we, 
it all fits within an umbrella. So, you know, pastor's part of that. But the reality is he has freedom to use how God has gifted him or to do senior things or to do uh, youth things or to do children things. That, that, we, that we intentionally, multitudes of us, invest in people. And so you don't have a single thread that, okay, I won somebody this year and they stayed. All right, next year I'll win somebody and they stay. And, you know, in 20 years we might have 20 people. What if instead one year I invest in somebody and they get saved? Next year two of us invest in people and they get they bring people to Christ. And then the next year, four people are doing it. And then uh, 16 people are doing it. And it explodes. That's the way the church was in the beginning. Intentionally investing, entrusting to other people what we have heard. That's what he's saying. Intentional investments with the idea that they can not just be founded, but then desire to reach others as well. Intentional investment. And by the way, faithful men. This is my, I, I'm just going to stop for a second because you know what the most important ability, whether it's reaching and discipling people or whatever it is, the most critical. I argue that the most critical feature, not talent, not brilliance of mind, not how tall they are or how pretty they are. I, I know you can't be like me. <laughs> Faithfulness, commitment, and a desire to serve God, care about people, and then just be faithful at it. Great rewards in heaven. I think that many of the, the first, last, last, first, you know, the mega church leaders that are leading everybody astray because they're corrupting the word of God, but they can do it in such a way that people come and it's all this stuff and it's all foolishness. Then there's somebody in the background that gets no attention and they're faithful to doing what God calls them to do. Now, which is better? I can tell you, faithfulness. He says, entrust this preciousness of the gospel. Entrust it to faithful people who will then reach others as well. An intentional relationship with others, and that's the goal, is for them to invest in others who will teach others also. We're such an individualistic society. But here's the goal. It's for me to get saved and then share that with people. So they might get saved and help them to grow so that they might invest in people. So they might get saved and so on and so on and so on. You know, young, young folks, uh, you know, and, and we do have ministry and we all have responsibility to reaching people in the school. What can I say? You all have the ability to reach people in the school that no one else will have. And I could go around and I could talk about every individual, that you've got a sphere of influence, that, that you're to reach others. What, hap what would happen if, if, if you had a desire to reach those around you with the gospel and to see them grow. You know what would happen? We would have New Testament Christianity going on instead of let's show up and, and uh, be entertained, try to not fall asleep for an hour. Discipling, the goal is to invest in others. Now, it's about relationships, but not just relationships. It's also about the truth the Word of God. The Word of God is centered. Discipling is centered. Christianity is centered in the Word of God. And it needs to be heard. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, 
do something with. Timothy, you heard the truth. You can't possibly respond to the truth unless you hear the truth. The truth needs to be heard. The Word of God needs to be heard. Not what people say about the Word of God, but the Word of God itself. Actually, the Word of God itself, and then it's useful to hear what people say about the Word of God. But you know, if, 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 if we in our, uh, in our lives, and Paul's talking to Timothy, and he said, you heard the truth of the Word of God, in this case, from Paul himself. You got to hear it. You got to digest it. You got to be changed by it. We need to hear the Word of God. As a Christian, what are we doing to, to hear the Word of God? Uh, you know, by the way, I, it, it's kind of a, and, and I, 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 I kind of go in cycles, uh, just like probably you do. You know, preacher never, never hears anybody preach. Because he's always up here talking, he's not up here listening. So I've got to do stuff intentionally to hear the word of God and to hear the word of God directly. And you know, and I study, but yeah, you know, and I've heard some people say, and and I don't I don't share that opinion, is well, you know, when you're studying, you ought to be, you know, you study and that's how you get fed as well. And yes, that's true. If I don't get up here and feel as convicted about stuff I say about the Word of God here, then I've got a problem. So there's an element of that that's true. And you know what, though? There's other times I just need to hear what God has to say. I need to have a plan, uh, whatever that is, of hearing the Word of God on a regular basis outside of, quote, my job. And so I usually do some form of Bible reading, a, a systematic Bible reading. Uh, and I'm like you. Some days I do great at it, and some days I don't do quite as well. And then I get have to get caught up. And uh, I, but I have to have that in addition to what I'm doing here. And you know, there's also something to be said about hearing the word of God preached and communicated. And I'll go for I might go for periods of time where I don't do that. But you know what? I, I just I. I, I'm back in the, in the full-fledged cycle again of listening every morning when I commute back and forth uh, to a podcast with one of my favorite people that I, I love to listen to. And sometimes I'll switch between two or three different ones. But every time, it's like, oh, my, oh, my, that is true, and that applies to me. In fact, in this particular guy I'm listening to now, Two, two major, major, almost one of those life-changing, God speaking in your ear almost kind of a thing happened before we, I left Kansas because I was struggling with it. And two issues, one was ministry, losing ministry, and the other was financial. Because I even had, I hadn't, I hadn't, I, wasn't, I don't think I was on Medicare yet or anyway, but anyway, so there's several issues there, huge issues. And as I was traveling and listening to the preaching, it's as if God said, huh, you don't think I can take care of you? Watch me. And I think it was on that same trip, uh, he said, ministry, yeah, we'll see. But do what I say. So one, I had a clear answer that this is going to be okay. And the other was, I may give this up for Christ for the rest of my life and never preach again. Are you willing to do that? And as I heard the word of God, it was as if God was speaking to me. That's why we need to be here on Sunday morning. This is the dynamic. We need personal word of God, but then we need community word of God where God speaks, uh, you know, in, a, in the same kind of way in a different format needs to be heard and embraced personally, but it can't stop there, then it needs to be told. What you've heard from me, entrust to faithful men. The 
Word of God and life is not just about me. Nor is it about you. We're only part of what God's big plan is. The Word of God needs to be told. Here's the truth. Seldom. You know, I told you the other day, a couple of weeks ago, that one of the kids went back there and said, you know, I want to get baptized. I want to get saved. Will you show me? Well, it, <laughs> that was about the third or fourth time in my life that's happened. Now, I've led a lot of people to the Lord through the years, but seldom do they, does that happen. And that actually wasn't, it was, wasn't because of my life, but it was because of somebody else speaking to them. Here's the truth. The Word of God needs to be spoken. And we need to do it in the midst of relationship if we can. We need to do it gently if we can. But the life won't change unless the Word of God is spoken. Unless people hear that Jesus has died for sin, they'll be lost. They may be impressed with how good you are and how, how much you love people and be one of their favorite people in the world, but without the Word of God, they're lost. We have to share it. And people that are confused in, in life, you know, again, same principle, is even if they're a Christian, they need to be told, they need to understand. And, and, and if we're going to explode the world for Christ, we need to find people that we can invest in and speak into their lives so they can speak into other people's lives. The truth needs to be told, spoken, and it needs to be multiplied. And these faithful men then will be able to teach others. That's the exponential factor. Discipling is centered in relationship and in truth. And together, they change lives. Simple, but hard to implement. And then finally, and I'll rush through these. Boy, I, 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 you know, discipling's a hard one. It's a tough job. Pastoring is hard. Leading a worship team is hard. <laughs> Some days harder than others. Uh, working with youth is always hard. <laughs> Being friends with somebody that you want to impact for Christ is hard. It's hard for everybody in this room. Discipling, impacting lives for Christ is hard. It requires a warrior's focus. Paul says to Timothy, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. It's like going to war. Yeah, because of our connection with Eastern Europe, I kind of have been, I watch, I, I look every day at the war in Ukraine, and, and uh, that would have been one of the options would have been in Kiev. Uh, we knew missionaries there, and also then we went to uh, Moscow. And, and actually, I taught in Obnitsk, one of the places that gets blown up on a regular basis by Ukraine, uh, was a secret city. Uh, so I, I taught there uh, pastors, and, I, and I, I think about them. And, and, you know, what on both sides, on Russia and Ukraine, of, of how difficult. It's hard. It's hard. I, I read this week about one guy that had his leg blown off, and he got, you know, he got rehabbed and got an artificial leg and went back to the front. It's hard. And if we're going to be what God wants us to do, we need to realize we need to share in suffering as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits and gets distracted and gets off focus and, and becomes, uh, you know, the priority list. You got one, two, three, four, five. Oh, and by the way, uh, church in Christ is number six. And if nothing else gets in the way, we're good. But I got six things higher on this list. And Christ is number one, and it's going to be tough. And if we entangle ourselves in so many different things, we, we may no longer be able to serve as a soldier. We have to have a warrior's focus. Know the mission, achieve the mission. Know the commander, follow what he says. A warrior's focus. Timothy, you've got to share in suffering. In fact, Paul would say, it's a joy to share in suffering for Christ. 
Christ suffered because he was speaking the truth, why would we not share in his suffering, even for speaking the truth and living out the truth? Share in suffering is a good soul. A warrior's focus, an athlete's discipline. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, there's two sets of those. Um, you know, the marathon runner from a few years ago that uh, in Boston, they went and they started the race, went to a coffee shop, sat around, drank some coffee, enjoyed themselves, took the bus down close to the finish line, rejoined the race, finished the race. What they didn't know, somebody was watching. Because as part of, I don't know, the jersey, they had GPS. So they found them out, and they were disqualified. Because they didn't compete according to the rules. Christians, we may think we're slipping by, sliding by, doing whatever, but somebody's got a GPS tracker on us, and, and we have to run the race like the athlete, exhausted, worn out, ready to quit, and persevering to the end in order to get the prize. Or you'll be disqualified. By the way, this also could mean not just competing during the race, but it also is the preparation for the race. What's the rules in order to be, even be able to compete? Got to get in shape. You got to run. You got to do those things. You know, if I were to get out tomorrow and try to run a marathon, it would, wouldn't last. You know, one time I got in really good shape in my 50s, I think, and I could jog very slowly for a mile. For a mile. And that, that was quite an achievement. Never before in my entire life have I been there. I was not an athletic, so I never was a, an athlete. Uh, but if I was going to run a race and expect to win, that means I've got to discipline my life. I've got to do the things that help and get rid of the junk food. You know, how many football players, you know, when they get past the first couple of years, how come they're, they became really, really good? They've learned to discipline their body. They've learned to be careful about what goes in, what goes out. An athlete's discipline if we're going to expect to be crowned. Otherwise, we can't participate. Thirdly, a farmer work ethic. The hardworking farmer he talks about. Hardworking. Now, that I, I, you know, being in Kansas for those years, those guys are hardworking. You kind of like being a dairy farmer. Uh, hard work, little show for it, you know. But you work at it, and you work at it, and you work at it, and you plow the stinking ground, you know, you, you let it sit fallow, and then they, they plow it up, and there is no fruit. They come and break up all the, the, the broken ground, and there's still no fruit. And they plow it, you got nice road, and there's still no fruit. And they go and they seed it. And there's still no fruit. And then the weeds pop up, and they go out and spray it or, 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 or plow it or whatever you know, the, 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 the problem was. And there's still no fruit. And then it sprouts and grows, and the wheat goes every which way. And if it rains... hardworking farmer who says just because you, you had a tough day today, well, what do you expect? This is a long-term, hardworking thing. You've got to have a hardworking farmer's ethic to be a Christian, to invest in others. And then this is my final slide. Let me just say, if you are those things, there's a reward. Now, a farmer may or may not, that, that's all, I, I could never be a farmer. Those guys get out there and they spend their entire year investing in the field. And the last day, a tornado pops up and hail knocks it off. In western Kansas, more likely, although that could happen too, is it, com it comes up and then it stops raining and everything dies. 
But with Christ, the hard work pays off. Guaranteed. Guaranteed harvest is like having an insurance policy, which they all did. So even if it looks like it's barren, Christ rewards the good soldier. He pleases the one who enlisted him. Isn't that what we want? Is to have Christ say, well done. And that's enough. The athlete that trains and trains and trains and does the right stuff is crowned with the crown of glory before Christ. And the hardworking farmer gets to share in the first share of the crops, honored at Christ's coming. We're met, Paul would say, by those that went before that he had led to Christ, that he had invested in Christ. It's always worth, discipling is a tough job, but it's always worth it. You know, Paul repeatedly said, so keep at it, because we know our work is not in vain or boring. Father, we invite you now to speak to hearts. Lord, that we might take all of this real seriously that the Christian life might be one that we engage in on purpose. That, Lord, we'll get your word and share your word, be changed by your word. That we'll build relationships because we love people. But in the midst of those relationships, Lord, change lives. May we give grace to one another. Lord, may you work in our lives. And that, Lord, in the midst of the difficulty and suffering and hard work, Lord, we look forward to the day when the great rewards are here and we see people in Christ together because of what you did and maybe some of that through us. So, Father, would you cause us to respond this morning? If we need to respond some way publicly, may people do that, whether that's joining the church, uh, maybe even coming down to pray, Lord, uh, however way you would choose Speak to us and help us to respond. And if somebody doesn't know you as Savior, may they realize that, that Christ died for them. And may they come and trust Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? If you need to make some sort of decision, would you respond? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed. It white as snow. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, be praying and, and, and be inviting and be praying who might you invite to uh, for the day of renewal. And, and use that as a tool. I, as always, doing special things in the church we don't have to wait for that day to be revived. We, need, we ought to be revived today, and we ought to deal with it. But there are tools by which we can invite someone else and say, hey, we're having something special. How about coming and, and going with me? That's why we do those things. Uh, so already be praying and deciding who could I invite and then be praying for that person and then invite them, okay? All right. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have anything else. Dennis, why don't you close us today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to come and hear your word. I pray that our hearts can be broken for at least one person in our life who doesn't know you and that we can just bring them up to you, Lord. I pray that we'll have the courage to invite somebody and to share the gospel with them as well. I pray that as we go out, we can put you first in everything we do. In Christ's name I pray.